a story that they've then created for themselves as I created for myself. Yeah. And I'm still creating for myself. Investment advice came to you when this thing's happening and it's going to completely wipe out your investment in 10 years time. You'd be leaning in and going, right, well, we really need to do something about it. But if then they turn around and went, yeah, it's mental health. You'd be like, all right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Outside of work, Scott, who are you? And I'll tell you what, two years ago, I couldn't tell you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the podcast in partnership with Smartcast, Arabian Business, and the Jahi Events. More about them later. Men's Mental Health. It's Mental Health Awareness Month this month, and today's guest is Scott Armstrong, the Editor-in-Chief of Arabian Business. And the reason he's on the show is that he has experienced mental health challenges himself, and our conversation leans into both of our troubles along the way. We have both experienced some highs and lows, some ups and downs, and things that have triggered different behavior patterns in us over the years. I know if you struggled at all, that this is going to be really relevant to you. And if you haven't, you might just learn something. So let's cue the music. Food security is a problem. Maybe not right now this minute, but it's definitely going to become a massive problem in the years ahead. We have an expanding population and we have less farmers producing less product. That means there's going to be food shortages in the future. And that's what smart casts are addressing. They're using smart technology, looking at how they can produce foods in different way, using less space, no pesticides, no chemicals, and 95% less water. And it's an important business. And I'm delighted that they have decided to sponsor the podcast because their message really needs to be shared with the world. Go check them out at Smartcast Tech on Instagram. That's S-M-A-R-T-K-A-S-T-E-C-H. Go check them out on Instagram. Give them a follow. Look at the work they're doing because it's really valuable and it's going to make a difference to all of our lives. Partnering with Arabian Business has been a real benefit to our podcast because it means expanded reach. That's really important. But also, Arabian Business, being the leading business publication here in the Middle East, wanted to try and incentivize you to get engaged with what they do. And you can get a 25% discount if you type AB Exec in the link below. That's AB Exec in the link below. And if I were you, if you want the latest business news here in the Middle East, that's where I'd be going. I'm proud to have worked with Najahi Events now for over three years. They were the first sponsor on the podcast and Alpha Mustafa, the founder, has been an incredible support. And Najahi Events, if you don't know them, they're an event company that bring motivational speakers like Tony Robbins, Nick Vujicic, uh, Prince EA here into the region to inspire and educate people in the Middle East. And I, I think they do a fantastic job. So go check out Najahi Events. It's N-A-J-A-H-I Events on Instagram and you'll see them there. And really give them a follow because they've got great content and great value they bring to the audiences they work with. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here on the podcast today. Pleasure to be here. It's, um, it's, it's really nice that you gave me the opportunity to get a chance to work with Arabian Business. And so I'm very grateful for that. But I think the, the core subject of, of my conversation with you today is to talk about the challenges that have become, I would say, more widely spoken about than maybe 20 or 30 years ago when we were both young, yeah. around the struggles that men have, particularly in this part of the world with mental health issues. and how it's dealt with, how it's captured, and what could potentially be done to, to give people either a, a better platform to share mm -hmm. or, or know what to do and where to go. Obviously, I've had my challenges myself in the past, and you and I have spoken uh, a few times about this kind of stuff. But yeah. For the benefit of people that listen and tune into this show, give me, give me a, a background of you and your career and your life in five minutes <laughs> and It'd take about 50 seconds yeah. and then and then maybe we can sit and just share what we've shared before so people yeah. can understand maybe the journey that we've both been on it's a background i mean i've been in journalism since i was 16 years old I had a difficult childhood um journalism my first job in journalism was probably my sort of savior from the situation i was in at the time 
um, five grand a year on the Newark advertiser. I won't tell you what Newark's an anagram of, but you can look that one up in Google. It's quite amusing. Um, but yeah, and I've, just been, I've been in journalism ever since. I've spent most of my life in England, but then about 13, 14 years ago, I moved, um, worked in the Bahamas for a year, which was interesting, and then came out to Abu Dhabi, um, worked in Oman for four years, ran a newspaper there, and then finally um, rocked up here back in Dubai couple of years shuttling back to Saudi Arabia. So I know the Gulf pretty well. I've been out here for like 12 years in Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi Dubai, uh, Muscat. I've been in Qatar and I've been in Saudi Arabia and Riyadh and a lot. So, so professionally, that's what I've been doing for most of my life. Um, and so, it, so, so as I look, re- listen into that, yeah. your depression or mental health issues started because you had to leave the Bahamas and move to Abu Dhabi? <laughs> <laughs> actually, it's kind of the other way around, actually. Oh, really? Uh, no, I mean, because the Bahamas is really, I mean, uh, I, I was, I, for me, it was great. I worked with this really hungry young team, and basically, because Miami's literally just like thirty minutes away, so they they were an inspiration to work with. But they all wanted to try and break into the states and get onto TV and that sort of thing. But you know, Bahamas is a great place to go for two weeks, but then to live island life, you know, there was well, there was a lot of alcohol involved, um, but there was also just not a lot to do outside of that. Um, so when we got here, and particularly my wife couldn't work when we were in the Bahamas. So when we got here, it was big city. It, it actually felt a lot freer than we were uh, in the Bahamas, you know, because we had so much opportunity and we saw how much potential there was out here, you know. And, and we arrived and I got off the plane, like not quite knowing. And it still surprises me that, you know, that image you have of the Gulf before you arrive in the Gulf. And it's still prevalent in the UK. Like me and you know just how amazingly free and you know, hosp- you know, the hospitality and all the restaurants and stuff. But getting off the plane, it was a total surprise. Like, oh, crikey, I didn't expect this. So actually, it was the other way around. Yeah, know, interesting. Like, Bahamas was great. And Bahamas also, like, we just, we got to leave the UK and get out of the comfort zone and went exploring. So best decision we ever made to go. And I'd say then the even better decision was to get on the plane and come here. Okay. I've actually got friends that live in the Cayman Islands that say they have to get off the island. Yeah every couple of months, so it drives them mad. Yeah. It's just the island fever. Yeah, and like everybody lives in each other's pockets. Yeah. You know, and you just can't get away from it. And there just, there isn't the vast opportunity to do things. You just start getting a bit stir crazy. Mm. So. so a lot of the time, my mental health issues are, d- are discussed by psychologists, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, as stuff that, that, that comes from something in our childhood, mm-hmm. an experience we have when we're young. but. I, I also know that suicide rates in men, the highest is between the age of 45 and 50. Yeah. And so this is how I would describe it. And this is just my opinion. You're young, you, whether you go to college, university or not, you start, you embark on your career. You're passionate and you're keen to get on and progress and do well. You go through your 20s, you end up in a relationship with somebody that ends up sometimes in marriage and sometimes divorce a few years later. Um, <laughs> And, and, and you build this Sick. career, yeah, okay. <laughs> and you build this career and then you, you, I think people get to a point when they're in their 40s and they, they look at what their ambition was when they were in their 20s and they yeah. didn't get there. Yeah. And because they didn't get there, it's like there's a, there's a sense that now I'm old rather than, well, I've still got another 40 years. It's yeah, like, absolutely. Now, now yeah. I'm old. And, and they go into this place of feeling that they've messed up their life or they've made the wrong decisions or... And, and there's no way of getting it back, which yeah. leads them on a downward spiral. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? No, I subscribe to that. I mean, yeah, and I, 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 I've looked into this quite a lot. I mean, I've got a boy who's 20, he's at university, you know, and the second biggest killer of young men is, you know, between 19 and 25, I think he's suicide. So I've looked at that. And then I came across that secondary stat, and I think we talked about it, about that age range things. I think, yeah, it is. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of pressure on us, you know, the way that, by then, you've got responsibilities. And I, I, I found this particularly during 2020 when I was in a job that I didn't particularly enjoy um, and I had a, a relationship with my manager that I didn't particularly enjoy. Um, and you know what it's like, particularly out here, you have the underlying stressor that if you lose your job, then you lose your kid's education, you lose your access to healthcare, and you probably have to get on the plane and go home. Um, and you don't want to lose that lifestyle. So there's, there's a, lot of spra- you know, a lot of pressure and a lot of responsibility. Um, and it's the fear of the thing rather than the thing itself. I think is you know, is on us a lot. And I got I really seriously got to a point where I was you know like when the WhatsApp went off, it was a physical reaction to WhatsApp. 
you know, it was like body tightening. Yeah. You know, sometimes it felt like my boss was in the corner of the room glaring at me at night when I was trying to get to sleep because it was just, you try, particularly during COVID as well, which again, I think has probably amplified it for a lot of people. It certainly did for me. It's like, well, we really don't want to be losing our job in this time. And actually when me and Christine and my wife sat down and we did the maths and we talked it through, it was like, yeah, but we're still fine. We're still fine as a family unit. We're still solid. So if we have to rip all this up and go, then it's just, it's physical things and circumstances, but as a family unit, we're okay. And then that was just like, you know, so there is so much pressure just like trying to keep up and deliver, and you know, particularly when you've got kids as well, you know, like we've got such a responsibility to deliver for them mm. that you want them to grow up with everything and all the opportunities you didn't have. Um, yeah. And how often do you actually check in with yourself and go, all right, well, someone asked me a really good question a while ago as well, was like, outside of work, Scott, who are you? And I'll tell you what, two years ago, I couldn't tell you. Like my identity was all linked to the fact that I was Scott the journalist. I couldn't tell you who Scott the person was or Scott the husband, you know, or I was, there's all the different roles, you know, Scott the husband, Scott the father, Scott the worker, but who's Scott? You know, like in the wee small hours in the morning, who's Scott, what's important to him and all that sort of thing. I think I'm asking those questions now, finally, you know, as I'm knocking on the door of 50 and waking up to the fact that there's work I've got to do on me, but for a long time, uh, that, the question really threw me. It's like, well, who are you outside of all of those roles that you've assumed, all those roles that have been given to you? You know, so it's, that's it, pressure. That's really, that's a, it's a fantastic question when you think about it, because I, 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 I bet most people can't answer that. Yeah. No, no matter what they do. The, the, the pressure that we experience, is that a pressure that you think we, we put on ourselves? Or do you think that's a pressure that's literally a genuine pressure from the outside in most cases? It's both, I think. I think it's both. I mean, it, obviously it's in society and what's expected of us and what's delivered. And also I think it's just got noisier and noisier. You know, um, when my dad was growing up, and we never had a conversation about mental health, but it was never really a, there wasn't even the conversation that there was a different way. And if you look at the, my grandparents' generation, it's just something you just did. Whereas now there's perhaps more self-examination. And also we feel we should have done it better than our, our you know, our fathers and our grandfathers and, and the like. So, but very much you see it, and I've seen it twice, you know, even, you know, this job is a great job, but it has its frustrations. Um, and it's very easy to kind of lean into that and just get like, oh, everything's wrong. And actually, you know, it's, if you change your frame of focus and set a step back and look at your life, um, you go, ah, actually, well, my kids are, you know, one's in university, one's in private education, they're really healthy, we're paying the bills, we've got a roof over our head, we're not in poverty, you know, we're going on holiday, we have having these nice meals, we live here, like, yeah, stop, you know, stop, reframe, stop for a second. I think we just get so wound up in the moment that we can't, you know, so it is pressure that we put on ourselves. And I think trying to step mm. away from it and just go, well, all right, what's the wider perspective? Yeah. I think, but, uh, and, and it's, it's funny because in 2020, I was in a situation that I really seriously didn't enjoy. Um, and I've then been in situations here where you're not nearly as bad, but they feel, or they almost feel the, the same way. And you go, like, no, actually it's not, you know, I've been in seriously difficult situations, you know, when I was a kid, you know, um, couch surfing, homeless at times, trying to find, you know, all sorts of family issues that, you know, and I had nothing then. So compared to then, well, what, what are you complaining about? It's just, but it is, you just get so wrapped up in it where it's like, can you stop and take a step back and actually look at it objectively, which is a difficult thing to do. Mm, I hear what you're saying. Sometimes, as you're telling me that, I sometimes think about how, if people do have issues with pressure um, and challenges that come from partially from the employer or the, or the particular person that they report to, how many people, if you asked 100, would feel comfortable going to that person and saying to them, look, I've, yeah. this is how I feel. Yeah, exactly. This is what I'm going through. Yeah. Um, can, we, can we have a conversation about that? Yeah. And, and first of all, how many would, and how many would believe that they would be received in the right way? You are in charge of a group of people. Has anyone yeah. ever approached you? Uh, yes, and I've approached them as well. Um, to go, you know, to kind of explore how they are and where they're at. Um, and that's very much been framed. That's alert and that's a real learning curve. Like I'm probably, I try hard now to look after my team and try hard to be a coach. 
Whereas that has, that's evolved from, I grew up in a hierarchical management system. I grew up in command and control. You know, when we got, you know, when we started in the world of work, it was just, just do it. You know, and if your boss wasn't great, you, that was, it was accepted that you were put up with it. Mm. And if your mental health wasn't great, it was just accepted that you would never talk about it and it wouldn't impact your job. I think now we're, we're beginning to see the benefits of leaning into it and going, okay, well, let's try and get the best out of you. You know, that's what sports coaches do. Their job is to try and get the best out of people on the pitch. But in the business world, we seem to have like ignored that for so long. It was just like, no, do as you're told, do as you're told, do as you're told. And a lot of that comes from, and I, you know, and I, and I know because I've been there and I've been that insecure leader in the past, in previous jobs, where it's like, there's all this pressure that you must be right all the time. And you're like, well, I can't be right all the time, but how, but I can't show that. I can't admit that I don't know everything. Yeah. So then I have to then just impress upon people, don't talk back to me, don't talk to me. And then you become a toxic leader. Um, and I think a lot of it's built, you know, it really just stems out of insecurity. If you compare it to 20 years ago, I, I, I would argue that it's obviously better, but is it, is, a, is a bit of it lip service? Is a bit of it kind of like, these are the things I should do even though I don't feel like I want to do them as, mm. as their boss? Um, ha, ha, have, have companies and leaders as much as you would hope, taken that as seriously as they not, should? Not nearly, not, ne not nearly as much as they should have. Um, I mean, again, it's a really interesting question. Is that lip service leads to gateway to somewhere better? Um, do they, it does that, does providing it with lip service at least give them some data to see, oh, actually that did actually work. Um, so we are opening the door on it, but yeah, I think we've, this, there are so, you know, there's a, such a long way to go on it. Um, and it's interesting because we've got the Gen Zs and the Millennials. Um, you know, we talk about the great resignation at the minute, which is actually quite often people at my end of the spectrum going, I've worked for someone for 30 years now, I want to leap off the cliff and you know, deliver my own success. And then there's the great, I'm never going to come and work for your company in the first place because the, gen gen the Generation Zs and the Millennials are a lot braver, but they also have more choices than we ever had. You know, when we went into the world of work, we had no choice but to go and work for someone. Mm -hmm. and to do as we're told. Now, A, we brought our kids up in a much more shielded manner, perhaps, than, so they've, they've got, almost got a right to expect more because we've raised them to expect more. So then you can't then put them into a world of work and go, no, don't expect work. Everything you, the way you've been raised, and I've actually had those conversations with people where they go, well, we were miserable, so why shouldn't they be miserable? Mm. And it was like, well, yeah, but was it fit for purpose when we went through it? Like, what would have happened if we had been raised in a, you know, sort of trained in a different way all those years ago, what would our potential have been? You know, you've risen to the top because of your own drive and determination and success. And hopefully you've had good mentors along the way, but I bet you've worked for a few people that you'd rather not work for and they've taught you some lessons. I think in the early stages of my career, I was glad to have a job. Yeah. Um, and so the good and the bad that came with it, um, we're, we're, and we're, but we're in different stages, well, isn't it, right now? I, I was the same. Like, my job literally put a roof over my head, you know, and so perhaps I defined everything by the acquisition of things because it was like, how am I going to make my life more comfortable from literally sleeping on a mate's couch or sometimes even outdoors, shall we say, to having a roof overhead, having a TV, having some money in your pocket, and you're actually going to be able to feed yourself on a regular basis. Our kids, they'll never know what that's like. So... They've, they've been raised in a different way. When you look at, the, 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 you talk about the great resignation and people not wanting to go to work and having a chance now to choose what they want to do, whether that's their side hustle or whatever it yeah. might be, working as a freelancer. We then see in the news just a, a week ago, Goldman Sachs saying, we're not that type of company. Everyone has to come back to work. Yeah. All right, that's the kind of company we are. Did you see the headline after that, which was, 50% didn't turn up. Really? Yeah. I didn't see that. Yeah, okay. that and there's a, there was a headline that said, Goldman Sachs says, everyone come back to the office. Next headline, 50% didn't turn up. So then how much talent has Goldman Sachs lost? Huge. Uh, huge. You know, and we know the cost of replacing staff. Yeah. Uh, particularly, you know, someone like Goldman Sachs. You know, we can see back in the UK, there's, there's, there's a lawyer, I think it's linked latest, there's a legal firm. And they've begun to invest in mental health because of the cost of replacing specialised, educated team members. So bravo to Goldman Sachs for trying to take your position, but it's, yeah, it's backfired on them. Wow. And you, you, we see now a lot of companies are leaning into the, the, not just the mental health, but 
all aspects of well-being mm. and investing now in that for their employees. And so it's great to see that companies are moving in that direction. Um, years, years ago, when companies had to buy medical insurance for their employees, they'd try and find the cheapest policy they yeah. could get to get everyone insured. Yeah. And now they're making more considered choices. They're taking time to understand the, the, the things that their employees need. And I think that, that that's an evolution of uh, an employee being a commodity yeah. before to an employee being a human being. That If you know how to get the best out of them, they could be really valuable or even more valuable for your business than they would have been without. And so when you, when you look at that, there's a direct result of doing it the right way. There's a direct benefit for a business of doing it the right way. It, it blows my mind how people of our age come from a generation where that wasn't even considered, acknowledged, considered, even thought about. Is I, it, I, I still have this conversation over and over again, you know, um, and, I, I, and I don't get why the chief financial officers of the companies aren't looking at this because if, if you're talking about, so what can we do to improve productivity? Well, let's work them harder, but hang on, here's a whole bunch of research that says, actually, if you do make this change, to, you know, to lean into their well-being and their mental health. You'll get this from them. There's a guy who came, Jeff, um, he wrote this book called The, the Motivation Myth, and he came and spoke at our, uh, uh, our AB Awards, and he, he gave a really interesting stat, which was like, the productivity, if you bring in a superstar, the increase in productivity can be anywhere between 15 and 20%. If you remove a toxic leader, the improvement in productivity can be nearly 60%. Wow. So it's by, by removing, you know, making the, the, the situation better, you actually get more out of the people that are in the team already. Jeff Hayden. Sorry, Jeff, if you're watching. <laughs> and, it's really, and it's a really good book. And, and, and he's like, a, you know, no holds barred. He's not like, oh, you know, crime your river. He's not, he, he doesn't lean too much into, you, you know, he advocates that you have personal responsibility for how well you do in a role and you can actually control, you know, how you lead into it. You know, not everything should be spoon fed to you. You know, you do need to step up and accept the consequences of perhaps, you know, not leaning into the job and the role and being proactive and getting up and taking action. He's not like a, you know, he's not preaching that everybody should just have, just be able to turn up for work and there'll be no stress because no job in the world is like that. You know, that's not reality. But he basically just says, look, if you're just a bit kinder or if you remove some of the stresses from your situation, you as a company will make more money. I think you just talked about it. Like the the research is like for every dollar spent in mental health, you get four dollars back. And if the ROI in that is you just make your place a little bit better, what's I don't know why leaderships are so opposed to it. We're kind of trapped in this way. Sorry, I get you got me on a rant, but it's like tell me, it's like the Victorian mill. You know, I, what, we've had this system of work for a hundred years, and like what else has not evolved for a hundred years? I just, you know, it, it confuses me that we can't seem to get away from this. Yes, nine to five, we need to see that in front of us um, and everything that comes with that. When people join the army, they go in there invariably for six to 16 years. And when they come out of the army, they find it very hard to adjust to Civvy Street, I think they call yeah, yeah. it. And when you talk to people, and I've got members of my family that are in the military, it's they lose a sense of belonging. They have no, no more do they have an identity. Mm. And with the thousands of people in the army and the tens or twenties or hundreds in the battalion, they were they were essentially just a number, but part of a team. Yeah. Do you think that that companies are doing enough to make their employees and contractors feel part of a, a family, part of a a team giving them a sense of belonging? Uh, yeah, well, no, but I think we're on, we're on that path to it in the, you know, and it's, it's not even a new phrase as well, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It long has, and it has in sports teams as well, you know. Um, are we beginning to wake up to that? I think we are. Um, is there also, because we've got a talent market, you know, the talent market right now, there's a real talent shortage. So the companies with those cultures that lead into those cultures, they're the ones that attract the talent. And the companies that don't change the way they operate, I mean, I genuinely think five, 10 years are gonna struggle. Because if you create this space where people can't be themselves and speak up and have ideas, then how are you gonna innovate? How are you gonna be agile? You kind of end up being that like, Kodak invents the, you know, the digital camera and then someone goes, hey, let's get that out there. No, 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 you know. Mm. Someone says to Nokia, I've invented a smartphone, shut up. You know what I mean? And you see the, the, concept, the business consequences mm. of, 
damping down on innovation and people being able to speak out and speak up within your organisations. It's not easy. Nobody wants to be challenged. We, of course, we all want to be right all the time. But the, the reality, the fact is we're not, and we're only going to learn if we listen to each other. So Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's, you know, people, people generally tend to buy life insurance at the time their child is born mm-hmm. or when someone in the family dies. Mm-hmm. So someone dies of cancer, it's like, holy mother of God, I hadn't thought about that, I haven't got life cover, let's get it done. Yeah. Uh, or a baby comes out. Yeah. And so you look at that and, and, and you know that there's a reaction to, to that situation happening. I wonder if, if something, I mean, let, let's imagine the worst case scenario, somebody hated their job so much that they took their own life. Is that the catalyst for an employer to go, hold on a minute, we really need to address this? And does, yeah. does it need to go that far before people respond? I'm, I'm not even sure that, that that's far enough you know, to, to create change. I mean, it has happened recently. And it's happened within companies that have, there was a, there was a case you know, um, recently, a young lad at Deloitte uh, who killed himself in the UK after having gone, you know, he was sacked it through a 10 minute meeting. And there was an inquest into it. Now, if you look at Deloitte as an organisation, they 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 talk an awful awful lot about wellness and mental health. You know, there's a I think it's their chief wellness well-being officer, Jen Fisher. She's actually quite yeah, you know, she's inspirational. So even with inside companies that are trying to do the right thing, this can still happen. Um, but yeah, you're right. And I I, I just I, I someone asked me this question the other day and it went. Imagine your chief risk officer came to you and said there was a piece of legislation in Europe that was going to impact your business and possibly close it down in 10 years' time. Or your investment advisor came to you and this thing's happening and it's going to completely wipe out your investment in 10 years' time. You'd be leaning in and going, right, well, we really need to do something about it. But if then they turn around and went, yeah, it's mental health, you'd be like, all right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah we can kick that can down the road. Mm-hmm. And I think mental health is almost like where ESG was five years ago. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, it, people used to think the environment and sustainability was just like a nice to have. And, it, and, there, and, and companies might even have a department that looked at sustainability and said, right, how are we going to make the company more sustainable? And actually now, um, if you talk to say Michael Chalhu, the Chalhu group, it's like it's now democratized all the way through the organization. So sustainability has to be in everything. I think right now we're in that bit where mental health is a conversation that's siloed in some of the companies that want to be, you know, want to lean into it and recognize it's a problem. There'll be some companies that are not even having that conversation yet. But where we need to get to is where it's democratized throughout the entire company. Like, so it's just woven into all of the policies. Do you think the Arab world because of being culturally different to us Brits, for example, do you think they are more inclined to lean into it or lean out out of it? I've spoken to unicorns here who don't speak out publicly, but when we talk about it, going, yeah, I've been in therapy for years. So they actually they they've had they you know and that's the that's the thing for me with mental health is that and I'm it's great that we're talking about this because we we'll talk one to one. I mean, you have talked one to one. And actually what we need to do is do more of this, which is talk to the camera and talk to the society. And then, you know, yeah, I mean, I know it's a bit trite, but that whole, it's okay to not be okay, because we're all a bit screwed, let's face it. I mean, the, the stats here in the UAE is one in three people will be impacted by mental health. The fact is it's close to the one in 1.5. You ain't gonna get away from it. You're not gonna escape it. But why, why is this the one last, or something like this, the one last great taboo that we can't talk about? Mm. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, I think about it. Is it because you know it's old-fashioned, and men are still men? You know, you know. I'm married to somebody from Russia, and, and her interpretation of what a man should do in a relationship is completely different from mine. She thinks, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. We went to a friend's house for dinner last night, and we, we, I said to her, "Grab a couple of bottles of wine to take to our friend's house for dinner," yeah. and she said, "Well, you get them." I said, "Well, I'll go and start the car up and call it." And so I start the car. She came out from the house carrying two bottles of wine as if she'd got a 25 kilo suitcase in her hand and plonked them down on the back seat and was like, for goodness sake, that's your job. And I was like, what's my job? She says, your Every, job to put the wine. I'm like, there's two bottles of wine you put in the car, get over it. And she's like, no, in, uh, it's a man's responsibility to carry things. It's, you know, it's, it's this kind of stuff. It's your responsibility. And so in, in, in her world, yeah. 
she, she sees the role completely differently. And if I spoke to her one-to-one -one about, you know, fears or, or, or challenges I was facing, I have to pick the environment that I have that conversation in. I, I can totally relate. Um, yeah. my, my wife is from Lithuania. <laughs> Christina, if you're watching, I'm really sorry. Um, but, um, yeah, and the amount of times that, you know, she'll turn around to me and go, oh, man up, you know. And sometimes she's absolutely bang on. And you kind of, you touch on this sometimes as well. Like sometimes we do just have to, all right, just stop. Stop complaining, you know, because yeah, complaining actually doesn't do you much good. That's the difference. Though. Complaining yeah. is one thing. It's yeah. not the same. Yeah, old man up. But there are there are times when you go like, could you just be on my side for once, <laughs> please? <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, she she has that yeah, quite sort of you know, not, not old fashioned, but it's just a different perspective of what men should be, shall we say? And I think that probably does exist here. I mean, you can get into a very long conversation about the patriarchy and the roles that are kind of enforced on men. And I know most women would go, you know, we had International Women's Day again, and we still have folks go, well, when is it Men's Day? And they like, you know, and roll their eyes. Mm -hmm. But I think there are, there are lots of guys out there that are actually trapped. We go back to the roles and responsibilities that we assume that we need. And I spoke to, a, you know, recently spoke to a couple of dads who basically they did have a mental health breakdown. They stepped away from the roles and responsibilities. They let their, because their wives had perfectly great jobs as well. Um, and they came, they stepped back to be the, the main carer in the in the household, and actually they've reset their default completely. And, and I'm like, I'm so jealous of you because they look so bloody happy, you know. So they're at home, they're connecting with their kids. Like you know what her life's like right now. Like I see my daughter, like for an hour in the morning and an hour at bed, you know, at bedtime, and I make sure I do it as much as often as I can. But it's like there's so much time I don't get to spend with her. I miss lockdown. I actually miss lockdown because I used to be able to go down and spend 10 minutes with her every lunchtime and connect with her there. So the, the whole idea of the four and a half day work week and the four day work week, you think that's good for us? Yeah, well, potentially, yeah. Um, do you, I, do, I, do I, the employers I, not like it though? Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, because the employees don't quite yet get the science behind it. And there will, there will be some jobs where you know that those shift patterns, because the, it literally is connected to, you have to be visibly present for that amount of time. If it's a project work, like something like my job, I can go and write an article at home. It doesn't matter if I do it at 10 o'clock at night or if I do it as long as it gets done. But there will be some things like particularly hospitality, you know, you can't be a taxi driver and work a four day week in a way, or that has implications for the way that a business is run. So that's a harder equation. That's a harder, you know, square, a circle, circle, square, whatever you want to call it. But, um, but why would a government introduce it? Why would a government, because there's obviously there's science behind it, because it's been tested. Yeah. The government have introduced it. We also saw in Sharjah, they went to four, four as opposed to four yeah. and a half. So the, the, the government's have introduced it, saying this is the right thing, because we, we, we as a, a government want people in this country to spend more time doing what they love and less time doing work, or, or being more efficient during four days as opposed to spreading it over five. I don't think, if, you, if, you're, if you're a company boss, or if you're a company, uh, I, you know, you look at what the UE has just said. The reason why they've done, and they've done it for two reasons. Well, I mean, it's been a PR masterstroke, I think, in terms of they've got a goal, which is how do we attract the brightest and best to our country? How do we attract talent? Which is going to be a massive thing for companies moving forward. And the UE has gone, how do we attract talent? I know, let's lean into well-being because the science is there. So they're kind of, the UE has made that almost corporate decision that a lot of companies haven't quite you can keep throwing research at them and research and that and it's only going to be when their attrition rate you know crosses that threshold coming back to those critical moments where they're going we really need to do something or we're going to be out of business um, so the UE's done that and then the second thing they were also incredibly clever because they used it also to realign with the international week because the UE wants to be this global trading partner so they've aligned with all the global markets but at the same time they've taken the advantage to put into black and white wellness matters um, which I think is, you know, it's, they've taken a decision or taken a, a position that corporations will have to take in five to 10 years if they want to bring the brightest and best. That's why the UE's done it, because they want to be the brightest and the best. They recognize if they get the most amount of talent into this country, they get the most amount of wealth generation, creative economy, all that sort of thing. That's, that's what drives the, company, the, the country forward for the next 30 years. You see where it's come from and where it's going. Would an employer have a fear of essentially giving the power to the employee. That's a management issue though, isn't it? Yeah, there is, a, and that, the, probably the key word in all of that is fear. And that's, that's actually 
a hiring problem, not even a management problem. And if you've then given all that, I mean, I think the employee increasingly does have the power anyway. As I say, particularly the Gen Zs and the millennials, you know, if you want them to come into your company, how are you going to persuade them to come into your company? Because you need them, to, you need the talent. You've got so many talented young people, particularly in this part of the world, because we're young, you know, we've got a younger demographic who are look, can look around and go, right, well, if I want to talk to an audience and create a product, I've got so many deliverable channels that me and you never have. Mm -hmm. They have choices that we don't have. Mm -hmm. They have choices that the employers perhaps don't get just yet. So I, I do, I think you can either, you know, it's not about be part of the solution or part of the problem. I think it's like, you either you have to lean in, otherwise you get left behind. You know, the world of work is innovating. The world of work is being disrupted. And every time I've seen an industry try and fight disruption, they've ended up losing. It's mm. very different. You know, we've seen we've seen that with the media industry that used to look at social media as the pretender, didn't recognise and didn't see the threat that social media faced to you know the advertising industry, the money that was the lifeblood of its industry, and it's been struggling ever since. So you can put your head and you know head in the sand with your fingers in the ears and go la 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 la, but doesn't mean it's not coming. Tell me, tell me about a time in your life where you were really impacted and didn't know who to turn to, didn't know who to talk to, didn't know which direction to head in and felt helpless. Yesterday? No, um, <laughs> it's mostly on a daily basis. Uh, no, I mean, there's, a, there's been a few points. I, I, and in some ways, you look at it and you can go, I can be quite grateful that I went through something but then learned from it. I mean, last year when I was in the situation, or the year before, sorry, in 2020, when I middle of COVID and we had that situation where I thought I was going to lose my job. It took me a while to have that conversation with my wife and she's my wife and she's partner. You know, and I trust her and I trust her judgment, but it took me a while to build up almost the courage to go, because, you know, it's not talking to her, it's talking to myself. Mm. It's, you know, it's building the courage to actually have the hard conversation with yourself. That's, that was the difficult bit, but, you know, three years ago I lost my dad and that was essentially due to a mental break mental health breakdown and he was the one person I always did used to talk to you know outside of my wife it was it was my dad it was um, a great sounding board for you he was yeah he, he was um, and we never had a conversation about mental health and I wish we had um, I mean, and he was you know he, he came from he came from absolute nothing you know he, he grew up in a part of Nottingham called Bestwood which was ironic because there were no trees it was just concrete and it was an absolute one of the worst places in Nottingham, but he overcame class prejudice. He got himself a scholarship to one of the finest schools in the city, he became a success, he became a CEO, set up a company very much like you, all that sort of thing. Most resilient guy I've ever met. His motto in life was Invictus Manio, which means I remain unvanquished. He was literally like, my frame of reference is it doesn't matter what's happened, he's still not beating me. And then he got faced with the mental health crisis and it, it killed him in three months. So. Yeah, so that, that, was, that was difficult. i tell you what was also an interesting one um, was when I'd been a journalist. And again, if I look back on something that was formative but difficult, I was a journalist for 30, 30 years. And then I moved not very much into strategic communications. But all of a sudden, I wasn't Scott editor-in-chief or Scott journalist. I was Scott, somebody in an industry that I hadn't worked in before, even though there's not that much distance between the two. And for the first three to four months in that job, I didn't know who I was. I was all over the place. And I couldn't be, you know, it's a difficult one to even articulate to my wife to talk about it because I couldn't articulate it to myself. You know, I've had my self image completely ripped up. What I, you know, who I thought I was and all those things, all of a sudden I'm not. You know, and I'm having to reprove myself to everybody, shall we say. Uh, and I feel like I need to be, you know, and all of a sudden you're like, oh no, no, I need your validation. And that's a difficult thing. Is that no spot? Mm. You know, what about you just validating yourself? Yeah. You know, how do you get to the point where again you felt, okay, yeah, I've got this. I'm in, I'm kind of in control. So, yeah, I was. Uh, it was. In looking back, I was so glad because I spent thirty years just being one thing, and then to have that ripped up, to get to the other side of that and be, yeah, okay, right. You know, that taught me a lot. But just being all literally all at sea for those first four months was was interesting, educational and upsetting at the time. I can really identify with that. In 2016, I, 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 I gave my business to my business partner to run. I said, I'm gonna step away, you wanna run it? She was like, yeah. And in, in that, and then she said to me, there's one condition. She said, give me your car park pass, a car park pass. And I'm like, why? She's like, because I don't want you to come to the office. Yeah. 
I was like, why? She said, because you're, you're the owner of this business. Yeah. If you come, then I'm not going to have the authority I need. So you're going to need to give me a chance to get on and, and do it. Yeah. So uh, I'll talk to you every day, but just stay away. And it was the right thing to do. She was, she was asking for the right thing. But in that, in that moment and for the following few months, I lost all my identity. Because mm. even though it might say on LinkedIn, I'm the chairman of this or whatever, but uh, I wasn't. I was the chairman of nothing. Yeah. I was, I, I was, you know, I, and even though she still saw me as the owner and the boss and everything else, well, I didn't see it because I didn't have any decisions to make. Well, how often do we actually get to have that, that conversation with ourselves as well? Because we operate mostly through life, you know, as I'm not who I think I am. I'm who I think you think I am. Yeah. You know, and so we're, we're, we're looking for validation in everyone around us. And it's, and we just get wrapped up so much in daily life um, that when do you get to stop and go, Right, me. Who 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 am I? You know, as you know, as a man, as a father, as a what's my purpose? Where what, yeah. where am I going? What am I doing? And we probably ask those questions where my dad might not have asked those questions. Or, do, you, do, do I mean, one of the things that I think really really hits home. I was watching something a couple of days ago, and it was like, do you know what you really want in life? Like, do you do you know what you really really want? You know, what would make you really, really happy consistently through your life? What kind of life do you want to live? Mm. And if you can identify what that is, is there anything like what you do now? And that for me is really telling because it, if I was to sit and tell you how my perfect life would look, I've got many arguments, many justifications as to why it won't, it won't be, ever be like that. Yeah. Is it a destination we ever arrive at anyway? I, I, don't think, I don't think, I don't think it's, it's, it's how you want your outcome to be. It's how you want to live your life. Yeah. And so yeah, I'll, I'll try and use some examples. So I like climbing mountains, okay? I like uh, action sports. I like being on the water. Um, I like skiing. I like activity, okay? I, like, I can't sit still, so yeah. I like that. So I, so I need that type of stimulation in my life. Um, and, uh, uh, and I love selling, all right? When I'm selling, I'm in a really happy place. When, you know, and a lot of people are like, oh my God, it's me selling, what a horrible life must be, just to be a salesman. It's like, when I look at the things that make me really happy, yeah. selling makes me really happy, okay? And being busy with lots of activities in a busy life. Yeah. I don't live that life. Why not? Okay. Ah, okay, why not? Because I've convinced myself that that's not the life that I should live, or I've, I've settled for a life that isn't my optimum life. So you go through my career. I started off as a salesperson. Yeah. I went all through the management, set up companies, yada, 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 I got to there. Okay, where did I have the most fun in my life? Selling. Yeah. Okay, competing. Yeah. Okay, how, how, how do I get stimulation? Go and sit on a beach in the Bahamas, go and sit on the beach in the Seychelles, no chance. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'd become an ax murderer if that's what I had to do really <laughs> for my life. I need to go and, and, uh, and do stuff. Yeah. All right. I'm not a foodie. Sitting in restaurants is a waste of time for me. I don't really drink, so going into, in, into bars is not really any fun for me. I need to be doing stuff. Yeah. And I think that so many people live their lives no, no, not even close to where they, where they actually really want to be. And they'll throw in the, well, I've got a family now. I've got a mortgage now. I've got a whatever it might be now. Yeah. But it's just, it's just a story that they've then created for themselves as I created for myself. Yeah. And I'm still creating for myself. I can sit and verbalize it to you right now, okay? And, you're, and you're, you're, your question is absolutely right. Well, why aren't you living that life? Yeah. It's like, I can tell you it, but it's very hard to still step into it. I read this book recently, which <laughs> was, it, and it was, it, it was called 4,000 Weeks by a guy called Oliver Berkman. Okay. Um, and the basic premise of, and it, it, was a, it was a little bit of like a, which was like, the basic premise is if you live to 80 years old, you get 4,000 weeks. And all of a sudden I'm like, F, no. 80 years or 100 years seems endless. Mm -hmm. That's never gonna end. I, I can't picture 80 years in my head. So I've got all the time in the world, one day I'll get there, one day I'll get there, one day I'll get there. But then when you look at it and go 4,000 weeks, I can imagine 4,000 weeks. I can imagine those on a calendar and I'm 2,600 into it, you know. And yeah, I'm three, you know, intending to live on, live to, a, well, I promised my daughter I'll live to 200, but, you know, I want to get to 100. I may have to change my lifestyle slightly to get there physically. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we don't have all the time in the world. And then there was another author I was reading recently who was basically like, 
we look all ninety percent of us either live in the past or live in the future. And I'm probably still, you know, I'm guilty of living in the future. I'm trying to drag myself, particularly because I've got a six-year-old girl, to be more present now. But the past doesn't exist anymore. It's had an impact on you, but it doesn't exist anymore. You can't change it. No way to get in that time machine back and go and change the things. And it's difficult to accept some of those things, but you've kind of got to because there's nothing you can do about it. And the future doesn't exist either. You can try and build to a plan, but it doesn't exist. So you're too busy. It is that whole mindfulness which I've began to begun to wake up to, but that you know all those imagined futures don't exist. So <laughs> people have to take responsibility for the things they do today, or try and make change for the things they do today. How can today be? You know, should there, should there be more support or guidance or education given? Um, to young people definitely uh, about this because i remember as you'll probably remember too going to your careers advisor i you know and they were like what do you want to do with your career and said oh, i want to be an astronaut they would be like well you should be a welder <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> you know we need or whatever it might be you look you've got one o level you're not really going to go very far so you know maybe you want to go work in a, in a, in a mechanics or whatever yeah. it might be get an apprenticeship the, the the work that's done with young people now you know I think I think hasn't really changed that much since no. I was young. I, was, look, I mean, I, again, I'm a massive believer in positive mental health and positive, you know, reinforcing. If you look at the kids today as well, they're growing up in. I mean, I worry. For, I worry for my daughter. That's why I'm so so super keen about mental health. Is like the kids today grow up in a really really complicated world and they can't get away from it. Like we had, I don't know whether you were bullied or whether you you know had awful things happen at school. You could get away from that and go and be in the park or go and play or go and be physical or be in your room. But when you're in a room, you, deal, you still didn't have the people shouting at you going, you're a waste of time, you're a waste of time. Now we've got social media that's completely reinforcing, you know, you know all the negative feelings about themselves. And, and worse, they're actually powered by algorithms that dial that up because that's the most engaging thing. So our children really do need better tools than we, they, they, they absolutely need them growing up. So if they grow up more secure and more confident and more with more self-belief, what's their potential? You know, and if we grow up in a world, you know, being grandiose, if we manage to get to a world where, you know, the kids grow up with more self-belief and they're less insecure, what does that actually mean for the forces in the world that want to polarize and want to capitalize on creating fear and instability and insecurity in people, the demagogues that want to advance themselves? So I think we need it. The kids, the, our children need it. They, mu they need much better mental health tools. Scott, as the ed ed editor-in-chief at Arabian Business, what, what type of role or, or responsibility do you have to educate people, to um, help people understand more about mental health within a business publication? I think it's the ideal place to do it because, I mean, look, we all spend so much time at work and I think, you know, in, when we have these conversations as well, the only thing I can say is that I actually haven't got it, I haven't got it figured out. I'm I'm still you know even as, as, as two years ago I was all at sea, but I'm asking the question and we need to ask the questions. We need to advance that things need to change. Um, so yeah, it's really I'll, I'll, it's really I'll, important. You've said something to me because you, you said um, about the impact of. of people not being happy in their job, the fact mm. that you know, if, if you get the best out of people, the yeah. companies will be way more profitable, yeah. yada, yada, yada. So as a business publication, yeah. okay, there, there's, a, there's a, a key measurement and metric, yeah. okay, that's been already established yeah. that can demonstrate if your employees are in the right place, you can get way more out yeah. of them. Okay, so in a business publication, what percentage of the content should be geared towards that type of conversation? I'd, I mean, I'm not yeah, a journalist, yeah, you yeah, are, yeah. so the reason that's why no, I'm No, I mean, thinking. and it's a good question. And the thing is, if we have the credible, you know, if we have the credibility to talk about the day-to-day -day business runnings, so say that's 50% or even 60% of what we talk about, does that then give us the credibility to talk to the leaders of organizations to go, well, actually, you need to be talking about this. So Raven Business, you know, I took a very, I wanted it to be a, a, a brand with purpose. And I think it, I very selfishly wanted it perhaps to reflect the journey that I was on, which was, okay, so we need to look at diversity and inclusion. We need to look at mental health and resilience. We need to look at ESG and we need to lean into the startup community and help. And I took over this place also when 
we were in the middle of COVID and the business community was completely beat up and really, really hurting. So my position at the time was there's plenty of media titles out there that are kind of dedicated to just, i.e. the day-to-day or pulling down. I want to do the day-to-day, but I want to do lifting up. Um, and that's just a specific direction that I've taken. Now, have I seen the conversation get louder and louder? Yeah. You know, you can, you can call it soft stuff, but it's not. Some of these are actually the, going to be the fundamental building blocks of business success in the future. And I've seen, even like with something like ESG, three years ago, I remember reading a column on ESG and I had to look at what ESG meant. And now it's in every boardroom. And now it's been democratised, like say Michael Chalhoub saying, yeah, well, we used to have a department that looked at it and now it's actually everybody's responsibility. Mm-hmm. You know, sustainability and the environment has become, you know, we used to have climate change now. We now know, we now know that it's real and we now know we have to take action. And also in the boardroom, they have to take care of it because there's legislation out there. So if they want to carry on doing their business, they have to embrace it. There's a, there's a direct impact on the bottom line if they ignore it. And it's the same conversation. And what I want to do is try and take the conversation about mental health in particular and phrase it in the language that makes sense inside the boardroom. It's like, you know, if you want to protect your profit margins, if you want to grow your business, if you want a sustainable future, if you don't want to be Nokia and just, you know, and, and these days, you know, from toxic work cultures, you can't bury that for long these days. I mean, it used to be that you'd read about it on Glassdoor. Now it's all over social media. Every, all your stakeholders, whether they're your employees, your customers, your investors, they're all activists. They've all got access to social media. And we see so many companies that get beset by headlines. Mm-hmm. Likewise, good old Goldman Sachs that made their bold headline. Yes, you're all going weird. No nonsense. You're all coming back. And 50% of the workforce went, no, we're not. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming to talk to me today. This is such an interesting conversation. Well, we could talk about this for hours. We probably need to talk about it for hours as well. How did that conversation impact you? What did it make you think? What did it make you feel? If you've experienced any challenges with mental health over the years, then you'll know that other people having empathy for you really makes it feel a little bit better. It's almost like you have a problem shared which becomes a problem halved. Talking to Scott and learning about his experiences and learning about the good work that's being done, I think is really valuable for all of us to kind of like process and, and, and take into ourselves and think about what we can do maybe for others in the future. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, then please do me a favour and click over here if you want to see other episodes. If you'd like to subscribe to the channel, which you know I would love you to do, click over here. It doesn't cost you anything, you subscribe. But that means then that YouTube are going to spread this out to more and more people so that they can get the benefit of this content too. So if you've got the time to do it, click over there, subscribe, and I'll see you on the next episode.